Hello and welcome to the Indie Author Podcast. Today my guest is Wendy Tyson. Wendy, how are you doing? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. It is my pleasure and, and I just want to say I'm so glad this finally worked out because we were contending with schedules and holidays and ill health and power outages and technical difficulties. So um, I'm very, very happy that we uh, finally were able to make it work out. Yeah, me too. <laughs> So just to give everyone a little background on you, Wendy Tyson is a writer, lawyer, and former therapist whose background has inspired her mysteries and thrillers. Wendy writes three mystery series, the best-selling Greenhouse Mystery Series and the popular Allison Campbell Mystery Series from Henry Press and the Delilah Percy Powers Crime Series from Down and Out Books. Her short stories have appeared in literary journals and she has short fiction in two anthologies, The Night of the Flood and Betrayed. And Wendy and her family live in Vermont, in a house that doesn't always have electricity. <laughs> <laughs> so I had the pleasure of hearing Wendy speak at the Philadelphia Writing Workshop on the topic, Five Things I Wish I Knew Before I Was Published. And I loved the message she had to share and wanted to share it with the listeners of the podcast. But Wendy, before we dive into the five things, just share a little bit about your background as an author and specifically what experiences did you have that led you to want to capture your thoughts about the five things you wish you had known? You know, I've been writing for a long time since I was a child, probably like many of your listeners. And uh, it wasn't until I was in my 40s that my first novel was published. And so in looking back on that journey, you know, there was probably 10 to 15 years of finding myself as an author, first a short story writer and then a novelist. And then finally breaking into the publishing field with a, a smaller uh, publisher. And so when I was preparing for the conference, I, I thought about what do I wish I had known prior to this journey? And that's where the I ideas came about. So I think just working my way up, getting to know myself as an author and as a person, inspired the five things. So let's just dive in then and I will give you the lesson from your presentation and then you can elaborate on it. And the first one is writing is hard. Your audience is saying, yeah, we know that part. You know, writing is, is hard. As I mentioned, I've been writing since I was a little kid and it wasn't really until I was in my 30s that I decided I wanted to write a novel. And at that point, I had just finished law school. I was working for a large law firm in Philadelphia, and I had just given birth to twins. And I remember telling my husband, I want, you know, I was really upset. It was before I went back to work. And I had short stories published, but I, I said, you know, I really want to write a novel. I want to write a novel. And finally, one day he just looked at me, he's an engineer, very practical, and he said, well, Wendy, then write, <laughs> then write a novel. And for me, I was angry at him for a while, but the realization dawned, okay, what, what is keeping me from writing a novel, right? Unlike so many things with writing, you don't need anything necessarily, right? You need a pen and paper, you need a computer, some time <laughs> to write, but it's not like we need a lot of assets or overhead. And so I think in some ways that makes it harder. It's almost this existential feeling that you have when you're faced with a blank page and trying to figure out what to put on there. We resist. So I think from that standpoint, just fundamentally, writing is hard. I think it's also hard because the rules don't apply, right? In law, I knew if I went to law school and I did well, I would get a good job. If I worked hard at my job, I would move up the food chain. I had a career trajectory that made sense. With writing, talent doesn't necessarily mean success, right? Hard work doesn't always mean sales. And so for many authors, there's just a frustration level with how things work and the fact that uh, it can feel very random at times. I think writing is also hard because as writers, we face rejection all the time. You know, they say you need to grow a thick skin, and I think it's true, but there's a balance, right? So you have to grow a thick skin, but at the same time, you need to remain vulnerable and open enough to influence and inform your writing. 
And so it's that, that balance um, of learning to deal with rejection. And guess what? Rejection doesn't end when your book is published, right? There's the reviews. There's the next book. And so it's that ever-evolving um, need to deal with rejection. So I think those are just a few of the reasons that writing is hard. Today, sometimes it feels like everybody <laughs> wants to be an author. And I think there's some things you can do if you truly want to write and want to recognize that it is difficult, but keep going. Things like honing craft, maintaining a learning mindset, remembering why you write in the first place. And one of the things I see so often with people is forgetting how to cultivate creativity, you know, digging deep uh, and really nurturing that side of yourself through the process. In the, the second episode of this podcast, I spoke with Wade Walton, who was a, a full-time video producer and manager of video producers. And we had a discussion about how do you maintain your creativity, especially when you're at a nine to five job and then you come home and there's another creative outlet that you want to take advantage of. So I'm going to link to that episode in the notes for this because I think it's applicable to what you're talking about. What got you over the point of being mad at your husband for saying, just write the novel <laughs> and then writing the novel? You know, I just, I think I just realized he was right, um, that he was right. And when I looked back, you know, at my writing trajectory at that point, I realized the thing that was missing was discipline. You know, I wrote when I felt like writing. I wrote when inspiration hit me. But the truth of the matter was I had worked hard for that law degree. I needed to go back to work. And so I had two choices. I could give it up or I could find a way to make it work. And so I decided to do the latter. I wrote every morning from about four o'clock until the twins woke up. Ah. <laughs> So, yeah, it took me a year and I had a draft. The book was called Running for the Train. And unfortunately, I did get an agent, but I did not get a publishing deal with that book. And it sits on my shelf, which is okay. Uh, it's probably where it should be. But it taught me something very important. And that's that, you know, there is an aspect as much as it may be a right brain activity from a creative standpoint, there is a discipline and a process that is important. And so just carving that time out, my brain was still too fuzzy. My sensor, you know, that one that sits on your shoulder and tells you everything you write is terrible, was still asleep at four in the morning. So ah, perfect. I think it worked out well. I no, I no longer get up quite that early. <laughs> and in terms of being able to accept rejection, you may be going to talk about this during one of your later points, but if not, Talk a little bit about whether you read your reviews and, and if you do, how you approach them. Yeah, I was at Mal's Domestic. And for those who aren't familiar, it's a major convention for mystery authors. And I, I had the opportunity to meet Harlan Coben. He was there for an award and I asked him for a piece of advice. And one of the pieces of advice he gave me was don't read your reviews online. <laughs> and at the time I laughed and I thought, oh, I can never do that. And I probably spent the first three years of my publishing career reading absolutely every review on Goodreads, Amazon. I don't as much anymore. I do peruse them and every once in a while I'll go on and read them, but I read them with, and I am going to touch on this later, I read them with perspective. I work very hard to remember that not everyone has to like my work and that's yeah. fine. You put it out there and once you put it out in the world, it's for someone else to perceive it and, and do with it what they will from that standpoint. And there's a letting go in that process. So moving on to number two, the second thing you wish you knew before you were published, that writing is hard, but the business of writing is harder. Oh, yes. Talk about that a little bit. <laughs> yes. I think anyone who's dabbled in this at all knows that that's probably very much the case. I was talking to a woman not too long ago who had been in the business of publishing for a long time, and she was shifting to writing. And she said she was looking forward to getting away from the marketing aspect. And I thought, oh, I hope for you that that's the case. The truth of the matter is that you really can't get away from the marketing piece. I work with an organization called International Thriller Writers, and I write for them as a columnist. And I have some friends who are authors all over the crime writing community. They run the spectrum from a genre perspective and from a publisher perspective, some are with larger publishers. And everyone, when I asked them what they thought, they wished they had known before they were published, every single one of them mentioned 
that marketing was this important and that the business of writing was this important. And I definitely had that on my list as well. It's not just marketing, it's understanding your audience, it's knowing how to present yourself, it's building a platform on social media. I know a lot of authors who are, you know, somewhat introverted. They love the, the activity of writing, but they don't necessarily want to be doing in public or virtual events. Unfortunately, that's all part of it. And so I think it's important to do a couple of things, if I can mention them. I think one, yes, if you're with a publisher, ask them for their marketing plan. So many authors are so excited to be published that they forget to do some very important things, like see what the publisher is going to do to help them get that book out there. Create their own publishing plan. Understand where they fit in the market. Understand what their goals are. Understand who their potential audience is. Understand what social media they're good at and willing to do. I know some authors who try to be on every social media platform, and that's extremely draining. And unless you're a full-time author who has the time on their hands and really enjoys it, I think that that can really be a detriment, ultimately. I, I said, think even if you are full-time, it's a detriment because it's, it's an energy drain, and obviously it's a time drain, too. And for every half hour you spend on Facebook and Twitter and Instagram and this and that is half an hour you're not spending writing. So I'm a huge proponent of pick the one or two and yes. stick with it. Yeah, pick one or two. Pick what you're good at, you enjoy, and where your, where your audience is. Where do they live, right? <laughs> so I think that's important. And then also in person. You know, when I went into this, I thought, oh, it'll be very easy to schedule bookstore signings. It's not always. Even if you're with a larger publisher sometimes, they want someone with a big name who's going to draw a larger crowd. And that's not to say you can't do it, but I think going in with a mindset and understanding that and understanding how you're going to approach those sorts of things, libraries, bookstores, and also thinking outside the box, right? One of the best events that I did was um, in Bryant Park in New York City. My agent set it up and it was a crossover opportunity. I write... Um, a cozy series that deals with organic gardening and cooking. And the, the people with whom I did the event do a food blog for New York City and they highlight a lot of organic products and local farmers, et cetera. And so we had a, a food and wine journalist come and interview us at Bryant Park during lunchtime and they sold our books and, and we did a panel discussion and it was all about food and crime writing. And <laughs> outside the box of what you would normally do. That's a great idea. That, yeah, is really important. So the business of writing is hard. I wish I had really realized that beforehand. And I wish I had realized some of the parameters of things that I should have been thinking about. The other thing I'll say, and I'll touch upon this in the next one too, it's never too early. I know so many authors, myself included, who felt disingenuous starting to do some of this before their first book was published. But I think thinking about it, in the early stages is important. One piece of advice I like to give people is that even if you're setting up a public facing Facebook presence, let's say, and the only people are following you are like your mom and your sister, <laughs> you should still pretend like you're posting for an audience of thousands because at some point you're going to have an audience of thousands and someone's going to look back at those first posts. And if they were clearly written for your mom and your sister, it's not going to present the professional image you want. Mm -hmm. And so even if you're posting for a tiny audience, bring that mindset that it's for a larger audience because that will give you a more professional presentation and enable you to expand better as your audience does become larger. I think you're so right. I think the other piece of that is not to sell all the time, right? Absolutely. Two authors, oftentimes we get on there and every post is, you know, about our book or a review that we've gotten. And, and I, I think it's okay here and there to do that. But I think if you have the mindset of entertaining and educating, you know, if you're writing, uh, if you're writing romance novels, highlight other romance novels, highlight book lists and inform your audience on, on, on other materials that are out there. But if you are sharing not just information about your books, I think you can reach a broader audience as well. Absolutely. I've heard people say uh, the 80-20 rule, that 80% of what you share should be not a yeah. sales pitch or even 90-10. You know, that, that the idea is to build a relationship. The idea isn't to force the people who are following you to purchase because they're not going to be following you very long if you do that. 
Right. I thought it was interesting when um, I finished my first book in 2013 and I was trying to make the decision about uh, whether to submit it to publishers or whether to publish it myself. And I talked to people who uh, had gone the traditional publishing route and asked them what their publishers did for them. And it was clear that the distinction between on the marketing side of what you have to do if you're indie or what you have to do if you're traditional was pretty small. Yeah. You know, that for the vast, vast majority of traditional authors, you have to take as much ownership and drive that as much as if you're publishing from an indie imprint. So a, a good lesson, regardless of what route you plan to take with your own book. I think you said something really important there. It's ownership. It's an owner's mindset. And, you know, I think as, as part of this, sometimes there's a lot of hat changing. And so you write with one hat. And sometimes we're shy about the work that we've done, right? Or we're modest or we're insecure. When you're wearing the owner's mindset, when you have your business hat on, you have to be your own best advocate. And so that takes a whole different skill set that you have to hone. But I do think in this business, fortunately or unfortunately, and whether you're traditionally published or with a small publisher or independently pub, you know, published, self-published, it comes into play. I think the other piece that I would re re be remiss if I didn't mention is return on investment. And that's something I've learned along the way with this as well. In the beginning, Maddie, I said yes to everything. I mean, financially, time-wise, I put so many resources into the selling aspect. And it really probably took me a year or two to realize that I needed to look at the return on investment for things and learn to say no not just to balance so that I had the time to do the actual writing, but because not everything worked. And so there's a, a progression that you'll learn, like what works for you, what works with your readers. And sometimes you have to be willing to try new things, but you know, there are definitely things that I've realized I won't do anymore because they either cost too much money or they take up too much time. Yeah, the time thing is key. I actually left my corporate job of several decades last year and I'm uh, writing full-time now, uh, writing both fiction and nonfiction and doing related activities. And I found that rather than suddenly expanding the scope of things I did, I actually got even more selective. And I was trying to be disciplined to say no to things that weren't going to help me make a living wage yeah. from the work I was doing. So it's a great point knowing that I've heard the phrase, uh, for everything you choose to do, you are choosing not to do something else. And uh, to weigh that, considering what your goals are. If your goal is to just have a good time with it, then you pick different things than if your goal is to make a living wage out of it. Great point. So on to number three, which is find your people. Yes. Talk a little bit about find your people. So this is probably the number one thing I wish that I had known well before I was published. I mentioned building a platform before your book comes out. I think this part is so important. I know when I did the writers conference, I mentioned a friend of mine who spent probably a decade really finding her people. She got involved with various organizations uh, in leadership roles and volunteer roles. She was involved in writers groups. In the crime writing world, we have the guppies of Sisters in Crime who are aspiring to be published. And she wasn't just involved, she was great about sharing. Every time somebody got their book published, she was out there cheerleading for them, sharing that information. I mentioned, you know, share things on your platform. She was supporting other authors. When her book came out, she made the USA Today bestsellers list. And, and I'm sure it was because it was a fabulous book and there are other factors at play. But I think she would say that some aspect of that was that she had, she had found her tribe. She had found her group and they really helped her at her launch. Compared to me, um, I pretty much wrote in a vacuum. I, I had three children. I was working full time. I wrote and then I really didn't start the, a whole lot of networking until after my first book came out. And it was really hard to build that community and build that platform once I had a publication date. I very much wish I had done that beforehand. You know, and, and I get asked often when I speak at festivals and conferences, how do you go about doing that? Writers at conventions and conferences are a great way to meet people. I think that um, 
Volunteering is a great way. I think that, you know, supporting other authors. So again, using your platform to uh, promote other authors and to help other authors. I think those are always giving back are always that you can build that community. Are you finding your people both among fellow authors and among your readers? Is there a find your people aspect of finding your readers as well? I think so, for sure. I mean, I guess when I wrote that, I was thinking more of fellow authors. But I will say that I have a group of just dedicated, phenomenal readers who are very supportive, and that's grown over time. But I think the piece that you can do before you're published is, is find that writing community of fellow, fellow authors. So now we're moving on to number four, which is maintain perspective. We touched on this a little bit already, but um, tell us a bit about your recommendations in terms of maintaining perspective. This was one that I had to dig a little bit more deeply for. You know, when your book first comes out, I think it's a time, for me at least, when I felt both very alone and it was a time of highs and lows. Because on one hand, you know, I did eventually develop that writing community. And I felt like the only people in that first six months to a year who really understood what I was going through were my author friends. And so that made my world feel very small. And, and while they were supportive and fabulous, I went through a period where I felt like, well, you know, my husband doesn't really get it, or my family members don't get it, or why aren't they supporting me more? On the other hand, the world felt very large. You know, your work is out there. Something you've been holding close to the chest maybe for years is suddenly out there for everyone to criticize and scrutinize and judge. And that is, that can be a little overwhelming. And I remember I got a, a particularly good review for my first book and I put it up on Facebook and a very kind reader sent me a message and she said, congratulations, that's fabulous. But remember not to get too excited over the good reviews or too upset over the bad reviews. And it really resonated with me and I've taken it to heart. Don't ride the highs too high or the lows too low and maintain perspective. Um, a hard truth is that my book, it's super important to me and my agent, my publisher, but you know, the world goes on. It's not the most important thing to my neighbor or necessarily even my spouse or my family members. And while they're incredibly supportive, I've had to remind myself that there are other priorities that happen. Um, at the same time, there are a lot of people who will, I think, downplay writing as not real work. And those of us in the field know very well that it is very much real work. And so there's a matter of um, retaining that will to create the discipline, maintain the discipline. You'll have people say, well, you know, you're not doing anything anyway. Can you do X? And reminding yourself of why you write and the fact that you um, have a right to, to retain that time and that's your job. That's what you do. And so it's that balance. It's that maintaining perspective, both seeing the writing and your, and your writing career for what it is, but at the same time recognizing that, you know, there is a bigger picture, I think, to be had. And for me, that was a tough, that was a little bit of a tough journey, possibly because I had wanted it for so long. I think that something that's helpful if you do read reviews is that I look back on reviews I wrote for books before I wrote a book myself. And sometimes I was complimentary and sometimes I was not complimentary, but I was writing the review in the interest of helping other readers decide whether this book was for them or not. Mm -hmm. I was not writing the review as a personal attack on the author. And I think a lot of people who write reviews don't even think about the author actually reading them. And so sometimes I think it's helpful to bring that perspective that they're writing it for someone else. Yeah. It's not like they're sending you a personal note telling you that they thought that this character was unlikable or that the middle was boring or whatever they happen to say. Yeah. And the other thing I found is that sometimes reviews can be a good source of market research. And the one action that I've taken on the basis of reviews is when I published my first book, I really had no idea who the audience was going to be. And then as uh, it was out there and I saw how people were reacting to it, it became clearer who my audience was. And my audience was mainly people who don't like a lot of profanity <laughs> in their books. And so I had a couple of, of reviewers 
comment that the one thing they didn't like about the book is that one of the characters swears a lot. And so I thought, oh, that's interesting. And I went in and I, I searched um, for the F word and it was in there like 17 times. Mm -hmm. And I thought, okay, well, maybe that's excessive. And I went back and, and read through all 17 instances. And some of them are like, no, that's what he would say. That's the kind of guy he is. That's what he would say. But some of them I thought, well, maybe not here. And so I didn't take them all out, but I, in an updated uh, version, I scaled it back a tiny bit. Yeah. But it is interesting to see how people are reacting. And if you do see a trend like that, you know, if one person posts it, then it's just somebody's opinion. But if you start seeing a trend, uh, especially if you're independently published and that's something you want to do something about, there's that option to act on it if you choose to. I think that's really good advice. Going back to this concept of writing is hard. One of the very hard things is reading your own work critically and learning whose opinions, feedback to listen to and when not to. And one of the aspects for me has always been that trend point. If I'm hearing the same thing from multiple people, I need to pay attention. I may ultimately decide that I'm going to go forward with how I want to do it. And, you know, that's a choice, but go in it with open eyes. And so from that standpoint, yeah, I would agree. I think reviews um, can be helpful. I have found across the multiple books that I have had out so far that most people write reviews in exactly the way that you've said, with an eye toward, you know, who might enjoy this. And that's great. There are people who, who can be mean. Yes. Um, international thriller writers had a fun bit for a while where they had f uh, famous authors read their worst reviews. On <laughs> I've <email>. seen that. <laughs> That's a riot. <laughs> and some of them were horrible. I mean, just awful. And that's where I think you need to maintain perspective, right? And, yes. and not, in my view, don't react. I make a point of I, I don't react to, to negative, negative views or negative reviews. But I like your idea. I think if you can approach it from that standpoint, you know, mm. by learning something and recognize where it's coming from, then it, it helps you definitely to maintain that balance. And it probably is therapeutic to go pick your favorite author, J.K. Rowling. I love J.K. Rowling. And go read all her one star reviews. And you could say, okay, if people are saying they hate JK Rowling, then, you know, if I get a one star review, I think I can live with it. Yeah. Yeah. And every once in a while you get the funny review, like I gave them one star because I thought I was buying Beverly Cleary. You're like, mm, I'm not sure why that warranted a one star review. The sad yeah. thing is as authors, we worry so much about the algorithms, right? And yes. You know, well, that one star review wasn't even meant for my book and now it's going to pull down. And that's where, you know, I'm, I'm no expert on any of that part of it. I just think sometimes you just have to take a deep breath and, um, and, and maintain perspective. Absolutely. So that brings us to uh, number five, which is remember to celebrate. This, I think, is my shortest, but it's important. In all of this, you forget to celebrate the milestones, right? Whether it's the very first chapter you've ever written, the very first draft of your first book, getting that publishing deal or publishing your book and having it out there, celebrate the little milestones. But I think it's just important to celebrate other people's successes. And, you know, again, along the way, that's been a lesson for me. You know, sometimes you watch other people's successes and think, why not me, right? Or I've worked hard for this. Um, going back to writing is hard and it doesn't always have a linear path. I think if we can truly as authors find joy in other people's successes in the fact that we're all in it for reading and for books, I think that it really helps to remind you of why you do this. And I think for me, it's been one of the aspects that has put me really helped me find joy in the process. That's great. What a nice way to phrase it, finding joy in the process. Mm -hmm. I like the comment about celebrating the early achievements, like finishing your first chapter, finishing your first draft, because that could be fodder for that finding your people aspect. If you're thinking of it as finding readers as well as finding your author community, because if you start out 
sharing those kinds of celebrations with your small pool, you know, your mom and your sister, whoever your small pool of followers is, that's something they're going to get really bought into. And by the time they've seen the stages you've gone through and your book is out there, then you have a ready-made audience there. You do. And I said this at the outset, you know, I've met a lot of authors along the way. And I think one of the things that many of the successful authors, and I'll use the word successful, not in the sense necessarily of being super wealthy or being a bestseller, but who have found their place in this writing world. One of the things I think they have in common is a learning mentality and the realization that craft is always developing, that their understanding of the business is always developing, that their ability to help others and to give back to the community is always developing. And that in and of itself can be a celebration as well whether it's going to a writer's retreat or taking a course um, or teaching a class, right, in a, in a school or working with kids. And so recognizing it as a, a much bigger endeavor, I think, but that it's made up of all these smaller parts and, and celebrating those smaller parts as well can be helpful. That's great. Well, Wendy, thank you so much for sharing your five things. I know that this is going to be hugely helpful, not only to people who are just starting out, but I think a great reminder, even to people who have been doing this for a while, just to hear those, those very important lessons. Well, thank you. And thank you for inviting me on the, on the podcast. I'm very excited to be here. And I wish your, I wish your listeners the best. Thank you. Why don't you just take a minute and let everyone know where they can find you online? Absolutely. So I am on Twitter. I'm Wendy Tyson at Wendy Tyson. I have a website, wendytyson.com. It's all pretty straightforward. Facebook, Wendy Tyson author. And so I'm pretty active on Twitter, Facebook, and then I, I try to keep things up to date on my website. Great. Well, thank you again, Wendy. It was great talking to you. All right. It was great to talk to you. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye.